the Congress. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a New York adopted person. And um, I am also the New York State Rep of the AAC and the creator of the citizens petition to enact the clean adoption reform law with over 10,000 supporters. It's an honor to be here with you at the 2020 Celia Center National Adoption Conference. That song you just heard was Ruth Edding, 1936. It's a sin to tell a lie. That's the year that New York started to tell the lies of our, uh, of our identities. And that was the year that they sealed our original birth certificates. So we thought it might be fun to play that because that's a lie they don't get to tell anymore in New York because as of one year ago yesterday, November 14th, 2019, Governor Andrew Cuomo signed our law, S3419, uh, signed our bill, S3419, into law, public health law 4138, Ease and Edward, New York, restoring unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult adopted persons, 84 years of discrimination over. So wherever you are on the East Coast, on the West Coast, good evening. I hope you're doing well. And I hope you're clapping right now for all of yourselves and all the people on this country and around the world that helped us to get um, to this place. Um, I am really honored today to be joined also by a fellow board mate at the American Adoption Congress, Shauna Hodgson, who serves with me on the board there and is a great activist from Texas. And she's moderating today and she's gonna be taking your questions. So hopefully we'll get back around to those in just a little while when we get uh, to the end. So you can see there on our cover page um, is the, um, the pen certificate. Governor Cuomo was kind enough to uh, furnish some pen certificates for us that show our brand new um, law, which as of yesterday is one year old. So it's a great way to celebrate our one year anniversary um, with you. So who's here with you today? Um, I'm Tim. And Sean is here. And um, Sean, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, these are our new headshots. We just got these shots taken, I think, last week. So I just want everybody to see how we're looking now, today, currently, before, so you know who you're dealing with. Um, Shauna, this is your new show. This is your new photo, right? <laughs> she laughed. Um, I don't know if anybody else. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is my new photo. <laughs> Right, so we want to just make sure everyone knows what we look like right. today, now, for our current headshots, because we don't want there to be any mistakes. If you see us on the street, we want to know who you're talking to. So uh, in all seriousness, that's me back in about 1970-something um, in Minnesota. I was adopted, born and adopted in New York, in Westchester County, and when I was about three years old, we moved to um, Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is. And Shauna, where were you? Where were you when that photo was taken? I, can you see me? I was in Connecticut with my um, adoptive family. And I think I was about five years old, four actually, or five years old. That's yeah. a, that's, we were exactly Tails the same and all. <laughs> yep, that's right. Shauna and I are almost exactly the yes, same. Yes. Anyway, moving on people, we've got a lot of work to do. Six months apart. That's right, six months apart. So uh, let's get into this because we're talking about how we restored unrestricted access to original birth certificates in the great state of New York and what we're gonna do next about this. So I really wanna welcome everybody again. We're gonna jump right into the, to the uh, meat of this thing. How do we summarize 84 years of discrimination in just one slide? Here's how we do it. In 1936, all the way through the 1960s, they built what I would call a wall, a wall of legislation and statute that blocked us from our own identities. I'm gonna come back to that in a, little, in a minute with a little bit more specifics, but just in case you wanted to know, what was the time frame in which they built this impediment in New York? It was 1936, pretty much through the 1960s. Now in 1980, we got our first clean bill. What is a clean bill? Clean means a bill that proposes to restore unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult uh, adopted persons. Um, and that's the standard by which uh, uh, we support bills now around the country at the American Adoption Congress. Going to be talking about that in some more detail too. Uh, I became an activist in 1999. And in 2003, I was very excited to lobby uh, for the creation of the first clean bill that I was involved in, which was our second clean bill that I'm aware of in New York State. We lobbied a man named Scott Stringer, who amended our bill uh, you might know that name, Scott Stringer. He's currently the New York City Comptroller. Um, and so we got our second bill. And that bill stayed clean. And in 2014, there was a hearing in the Health Committee 
to vet that bill, and it did very, very well. And then suddenly in 2015, as a lot of you may know, there was a crash, a debacle, a terrible situation. The bill got amended down in the waning hours of the 2015 session and what to do. So we came back together to try to figure out what to happen. And in the fall of 2015, I sort of jumped back into activism. I had stepped away for a while, started making some calls. And in uh, 2016, I began a petition that some of you might know about on change.org, a citizen's petition to enact the clean adoption reform law. It started out as being called uh, the citizen petition to restore the clean adoption reform bill. And then we changed the bill uh, to uh, citizen petition to advance the clean adoption reform bill. And then it was the citizen's petition to enact the clean adoption reform law. So it had three phases. And it started here in Brooklyn, where I live in Brooklyn. And I would go right down the street to Sean Casey Animal Rescue. And they let me set up a table outside. And I would talk to the, the dog walk. People would come and volunteer to walk dogs. And I'd set up a table and I had my computer. And I would ask people if they wanted to sign my, um, my rights petition. And they were like, oh, is this for pets? And I was like, no, this is for people. And they were like, so what are you talking about? I said, did you know that if you adopt a cat or a dog from this place right now, that cat or dog, you will be able to have more rights to know about their history than I, as a New York adopted person, a human living person being, have, has rights to know about my own background. And people didn't know about this issue. I decided it was really time to go on the street, talk to people, meet them in person, look them in the eye, and really make the case for unrestricted access to original birth certificates because it's a human and civil right. And when I talked to people, I gathered hundreds and hundreds of signatures just in my own neighborhood, and that helped us to launch our petition. So if you are on this call right now and you supported our petition, I want you to pat yourself on the back right now. I want you to applaud yourself. You helped us to change the law in a state where they said we would never, ever do it, that it could not happen. We did do it. It is here, it is reality, we are never going back, and you are part of the reason that that happened. If you were not part of that petition, we really wanna thank you for being here because this is one of the greatest human and civil rights causes that's going on anywhere in the world right now because it really helps a lot of people, and I'm gonna get into that in just a minute too. 2017, the, the, the dirty bill, as we called it, the regressive bill, the bill that would have made it harder, not easier for us to get our birth certificates, was happily vetoed by Governor Cuomo. Um, and we celebrated that veto. And then in 2018, Governor Cuomo asked us to come back and hold a work group. And in March of 2018, I was honored to be a part of a Department of Health work group in Albany, where we met with the Department of Health, um, the, the unified court system, and uh, the uh, several state agencies, including uh, 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 other groups such as uh, uh, you know, our, our sponsor, for sure. And we met with other parts of the uh, advocacy community. I was the only New York adopted person in that meeting, it was the stakeholder, and I was there to make the case for clean adoption reform. And after that, there was a report issued about the fact that that discussion should go forward. And I was very glad then to move forward with a clean bill. In the waning part of 2018 session, we didn't have much time to move the bill, but in the late part of 2018, before the 2019 session, we made a lot of technical amendments to the bill, improved the bill language, came back in 2019. And as many of you know, in June of 2019, we got our bill passed in the New York Senate and the New York Assembly overwhelmingly with a super majority of support. And on November 14th, 2019, Governor Cuomo signed the bill into law. On January 15th, 2020, it went into effect. So between November 14th, 2019 and January 15th, 2020, that was the time that we worked with the Department of Health while they promulgated rules to make sure we would all have a smooth transition into getting our birth certificates. But as many of you know, there have been delays because of the pandemic. I'm gonna be talking about that in just a, get, a little bit in a minute, but um, those birth certificates are being processed and I uh, was happy myself to receive mine in February. Okay, equality is the key. And we are in a political moment right now where many people are talking about equality for people from many different backgrounds. Whatever your political aspirations or thoughts are about this, I think we can all agree as Americans that it is very important that we advance the American equality for all people. And so here's a thought for you. Being adopted is not inherent to our identities. However, the restoration of unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult adoptees advances equality, not just in the context of adoption, but also in areas of identity that are inherent to ourselves. We're very proud about this, and this really, I think, underscores the importance 
of equality and true rights for adoptees. I estimate in New York, because the state couldn't tell us, we asked them to tell us how many sealed original birth certificates there were in the state. The city and state departments of health, there are two departments of health in the state, and that's the Department of Health for outside the five boroughs, that's the New York State Department of Health. And then there's the Department of Health for inside the five boroughs of New York City, like Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, right? Um, and that Department of Health also told us they couldn't tell us how many sealed original birth certificates there are. Now, some states can report that statistic. Ours could not. So I did a very complicated um, formula on this. It, it comes out to about 3.34% of a state's current population in any given state. So I estimate that there are 647,960 sealed original birth certificates in New York State. I'm proud to say, obviously, that we've restored access to 100% of those birth certificates. And based on the US Department of Health and Human Services survey of adopted parents per capita, that means that we've restored access to what I estimate is 149,030 uh, birth certificates of African-Americans, Black, non-Hispanic uh, people who are New York uh, adopted persons. And by the way, I want to add, just quickly, just put this in there, that our bill also doesn't just restore access to original birth certificates for the adult adoptee, it establishes access for direct line descendants of the deceased adopted person, and it establishes access for legal representatives of the adopted person or the deceased adopted person's direct line descendants. Another great feature of our law is that if you're born somewhere else, but adopted in New York, you have the right to the identifying information that would have appeared on that original birth certificate because the Department of Health is issuing letters to those persons to let them know that they can go to an authorized agency involved with placing of children, could very often be the court, could possibly be the agency, but very often it's the family court or the surrogates court. And that identifying information, you have a right to it. And we're very excited now, we're waiting for the first people to let me know that that part of the law is working. And I'm very thankful to the State Department of Health at first, they weren't going to issue letters uh, stating uh, that you could go to the authorized agency because they weren't sure that that wouldn't constitute legal advice. But we let them know it's not legal counsel. You're just telling them uh, how they can benefit from the law. And now they are issuing those letters. So if you were born outside New York but adopted within New York, please submit an application. You will get a letter that reminds you that you can go to an authorized agency. And even without it, you should be able to approach them. Okay. So Hispanics and uh, Hispanic background. An Asian background, about 15%, equally about 97,000 um, uh, birth certificates. And then, of course, you know, LGBTQ uh, citizens also have a very important issue of identity. And we're very happy that, by my estimate, 29,158 birth certificates there. Uh, so all people, all backgrounds, equality. And this, I believe, helps to support and push forward causes that aren't necessarily inherently perceived to be part of ours, but we are here to support um, all uh, people and achieving equality. Uh, let's talk about the big picture. Let's get back to how this kind of, this unfortunate situation sort of began. In the United States in 1917, uh, in Minnesota, that's when they began to seal original birth certificates and issue what's called an amended birth certificate. An amended birth certificate is the birth certificate, many know, uh, has your adopted parent's name, has the adoptive, the person, the adopted person's adoptive name, and it is as if you were born to your adoptive parents. Uh, the original birth certificate is sealed away, and in 48 of the states, access <clears throat> was subsequently blocked. There are two states, all states seal the original birth certificates. What we're fighting for is for access to that sealed original birth certificate in a way that will uh, it, it not a lot necessarily used for identification purposes, for uh, official identification purposes, but for our own background, because it's our identity and it belongs to us. And that birth certificate was created for our benefit, nobody else's. Kansas and Alaska are the two states that never blocked access to adult adoptees to their original birth certificates. As I said a moment ago in the 1930s, that's when the OBCs or original birth certificates were sealed in New York, and the court records were also sealed two years later in 1938, and we began to issue the amended birth certificates. In the 1960s, they sealed or began to seal the decrees of adoption. Some adoptive families were receiving the decrees of adoption, which would show the identifying information of the birth family, and that allowed some adoptees to be able to locate their birth parents, even though, if they wanted to, even though 
um, they didn't have the original birth certificate. So what I want to point out is this. There has sometimes been debates about whether or not Governor Lehman in 1936 meant ill. As you can see there, he looks extremely excited, very happy, well-rested, big smile on his face. He's very, very pleased. Uh, so uh, that, by the way, is the picture of Governor Lehman that hangs in the Hall of Governors. And it's always fun to kind of walk by that and kind of give him a wink and tell him, look what we did, pal. But um, what I want to say about this, all seriousness, is that one, any single law removed equality. Any single law removed equality, whether it was the birth certificates, whether it was the court records, whether it was the decrees. But it was the series of laws that collectively blocked us as adopted persons from our identities. That is not acceptable for the following reason. It is a basic human right to know where you come from. And therefore, it's a basic civil right to have unrestricted access to the document that establishes you as a citizen of your state and of your nation. That's, that's your original uh, birth certificate. So again, there are debates about whether or not Governor Lehman <clears throat> meant to be uh, pernicious about this or difficult about this. Um, I'm open to varying opinions about that. I, I make no presumptions. Mr. Lehman is not here to chat with us now. Um, he's deceased, but um, you know whatever his intent was, we know what the stated intent was. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, we know that the, the cumulative effect of those laws was to create a human and civil rights barrier that was insidious and hurt hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of people. Because when you block access to adult adoptees to their birth certificate, then their children and their children's children are denied their birthright. So we're talking about millions and millions of New Yorkers. And when you consider that 60% of, of Americans are touched by adoption, that's a lot of folks. Were secrets and fear okay? Because sometimes we hear people saying, okay, enough is enough. It's time to unseal the records. And we, again, we didn't unseal them. We restored access. Uh, and they say, well, in this day and age, we shouldn't do it. Well, there was no day and age that we should have done it. There was no time when blocking people from their identities, from their original birth certificates was okay. It is a human and civil right. As I said, Kansas and Alaska never blocked access. But let's go back in time a little bit. You might be thinking, well, as of the 70s, we figured this out, right? Well, because England un unsealed or made access to their adoption files in the 70s, albeit with some, some restrictions that we wouldn't support, such as, I think, counseling. In 1953, you go back a little bit further, and the National Association of Vital Statistics said that we should maintain openness and adoption and access to the birth records. So maybe you're thinking in the 50s, people were coming around to it. In the 1940s, all the experts were saying that access to original birth certificates should be maintained. And this is uh, according to Professor Elizabeth Samuels from the University of Baltimore and her great testimony to the Health uh, Committee in 2014. But no, no, no. Let's go back to 1935. Let's go back to Sister Dominica Maria, who was the superintendent of the New York Foundling, who said in a letter to Governor Lehman that it is an inalienable, inalienable right for people of a, it, is, it nullifies an inalienable right of a person to know the a, actual facts of his birth, his or her birth, we'll say. Obviously, that was 1935, and very often they would refer to people as his, but his or her birth. This was Sister Dominica Maria of the New York Founding Hospital in 1935, warning Governor Lehman. You might be thinking, well, maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe she's an outlier. Maybe she was by herself. Maybe she was the only one. Not so fast. What about Catholic Charities? April 18, 1935, the above bills should not be approved. They failed to take into consideration many important rights of the mother and the child. The mere fact of being able to, uh, unable to trace family because of the falsity of records, falsity of records, creates distress and heartaches for the very persons it is planned to protect. Catholic Charities. That might surprise a few people because the Catholic Church, as we all know, or as many of us are, are aware, came out in opposition to openness or, or, or access to our birth certificates in various states. Um, and, uh, not so much vocal in New York where I am, but in other states, we know that uh, Catholic interests have come out against this access, which is inexcusable, partly because it's wrong, partly because they turn their back on their, on their own policy. And this was, this was their own uh, counsel to Governor Lehman. So it might surprise a few people. Very interesting. Now we wonder if, if Sister Dominica Maria might be a Saint Dominica Maria because we found that on January 27th, 1938, the New York Times reported that Sister Dominica Maria had been transferred from the New York Foundling Hospital to become the superintendent of Seton Hospital uh, uh, for tuberculosis on Spiten Dival Parkway. 
Now, we can't say whether or not there's a connection between her standing up for adoptee rights in 1935. Uh, we can't say there was a connection between those two things. But if Sister Dominica Maria were here, we would thank her. I would thank her. And I hope that people might uh, begin to remember her name as someone who really tried to prevent this from happening in New York. Um, anyway, so why was access blocked then? Why did they do it? If there were all these warnings and it didn't seem like a good idea, according to the child advocacy groups, what was going on? Well, Machiavellianism, Machiavellianism is when you have a stated reason for something, and you have a real reason for something. In all of the bill jackets that we received for the legislation in the 1930s, the stated reason was to combat a perceived stigma of being illegitimate. There is no stigma to being an adopted person in New York or anywhere. And even if there was a stigma, it's our opinion, it's my view as well, you would never uh, address a stigma through creating a secret of someone's identity. So this was very misguided policy, obviously. I asked Florence Fisher, the great founder of our movement and the founder of the Adoptees Liberty Movement Association, what she thought. She said, Tim, it really comes down to one thing. It's control with secrecy. And we know that Louise Wise Services uh, conducted ex the experiments of placing twins and triplets uh, in uh, different homes to make longitudinal studies of them. Now, something very interesting happened. After we received the veto, the happy celebration, we celebrated the veto in 2017 of the regressive bill. I was introduced to a birth mother who supported us. And she let me know through some research that she had done that the twin and triplet studies were really just the tip of the iceberg at Louise Wise. They went further than that, that they did more than that, that other things happen. These are things I actually would like to get into tonight, but I wanna tell you that I'm not, I am can't, uh, but we will be able to soon. On January 26, 2021, I'm very happy to announce, I think she's with us tonight. So Gabrielle uh, Glazer, if you're with us, I'm waving to you now, very happy to be with you. Gabrielle Glazer, an investigative journalist, uh, is writing a book called American Baby. And she wrote a great op-ed in 2018 in the New York Times that I was honored to assist with. And Shauna and I, uh, who's here, Shauna and I, I shared this research with Shauna. Shauna and I began to work on this ourselves. And Shauna and I made the decision to read Gabrielle into this information. Gabrielle then took the ball and ran in ways that were unbelievable and has now begun to work the details of these uh, revelations and things that, uh, need to be known uh, into this book. I hope that all of you will please be prepared to pick up a copy of American Baby uh, on January 26th. I'm sure they'll be pre-ordering. It's coming out from Viking Press. And um, Gabrielle, thank you so much if you're here and can you hear my voice um, for your ongoing work. And Shauna, I just want to know um, how it felt for you to be a part of this. Do you have anything to say at this point um, about uh, this research that we're doing? Ryan? Yeah, it was an honor to work with Gabrielle and, and work with you. And um, we had an opportunity to uh, um, dig into something that I don't think either one of us was ready for or, or even expected, but I feel privileged to be part of this. And we cannot thank Gabrielle enough for her work um, on this. So um, yeah. very honored. And I, I think it's gonna, I... It's, gonna change, it's gonna change the narrative. I remember when I first told you about this, and I was scared that, uh, you know, we would, uh, I was, I was white as a sheet and wondering whether or not um, <laughs> you would think I was crazy, but we did it and um, we're looking forward to January. So let's move. Right. Absolutely. So when we talk to people about adoptee rights and we talk to people about our cause, we sometimes run into um, statements, uh, preconceived notions um, about, about it, such as that, uh, Birth parents were promised confidentiality. There's a perception of privacy. A court process exists. You can go get your birth certificate by petitioning the court. Birth parents don't really want contact. Abortions will go up. Uh, what about women's reproductive rights? There's no real groundswell of support for this, right? The courts will reject you. Uh, uh, the courts will not uphold such a statute. Um, you've got the same rights as a fostered adult. Families will be destroyed if you find your birth parents. You're intruding upon them. It opens closed adoptions, and there's no practical inconvenience to you anyway. Well, when they say those things, I want you to know 
we're very comfortable with that. <laughs> we're very, very comfortable with that because we've really, really worked hard in our lobbying packets and our efforts to debunk those arguments. And we've debunked all of them, all of them. And I want you to see there's a summary of some of the things that we do say that helps to factually refute those arguments. Um, but the top one I have in bold, uh, that, that, that birth parents were promised confidentiality. And therefore, we're going back on a promise. We can't really do that, can we? Well, let's take a look at that. Are we going back on a promise when we restore unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult adopted persons? Let me say this about confidentiality and privacy. We all value it in life, we're Americans, and we all, it's normal to seek privacy and confidentiality. We ought to, it belongs to us. Those, those assurances from practitioners to birth parents of confidentiality, if they took place, were ephemeral. Those were short-term assurances. Uh, in other words, they had to do with not telling people about a pregnancy that was ongoing to the community. Now, wittingly or unwittingly, that type of assurance becomes sometimes conflated with the concept of anonymity, which is actually something different. In fact, it was not possible to promise lifelong anonymity from surrendered sons and daughters. We know this empirically for our own work, and we also know this partially because uh, Dr. Elizabeth Samuels has done great work to find the, uh, many, many surrender forms that birth parents sign uh, that, that not only don't promise anything to them, very often requires them to promise that they will not interfere with the adopted family. Now, there are four reasons why anonymity was not legally possible. Number one, it's not in the law, <laughs> very simply. Number two, it wasn't on the placement or the surrender forms. Placement is when you place the child for adoption or the, or the person for adoption, and the surrender is when the adoption is actually finalized. So those are two separate events. Third, there's always been a mechanism to petition the court for good cause to, un to unseal the birth record, but that doesn't give anybody a right to that information, and there's no guarantee that you'll get it. In fact, there's a likelihood of failure of those petitions. So there's no remedy in that option that's likely to occur. And finally, and this is one that I think a lot of people don't realize, there's no guarantee of an adoption. I myself spent six weeks in foster care. If I had never been adopted, then I would have stayed in foster care. And when I turned 18, I would have had the same right to my birth certificate as all non-adopted people. Because if you're a foster care person and ages out of the system, you are a non-adopted person. So it was actually not possible to promise anonymity, even if someone thought they were assuring someone of it. Now, what we found is that 95 or upwards of more than that percent of our, of our concerned legislators, once they heard what was on this slide, their concerns were eradicated, they were gone. But we also talked through many of these other things such as uh, you know, uh, the court process. You know, they thought, well, there's already a process there for you. And we let them know, as I said a minute ago, yes, that's true. There is an opportunity without a real remedy. It's like going to the hardware store to get milk. It's not something that really works too often. Well, what about the you know, unrestricted access isn't really working anywhere? Well, we, we were able to show uh, that it does. We were able to show that um, unrestricted access was upheld uh, by the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, that uh, Chief uh, uh, that uh, Sandra Day O'Connor from the Supreme Court refused to stay the law in Oregon in 1999. Uh, so these are things that um, help us to make our argument, and we were able to win over many, many uh, legislators in New York and get a super majority of support and pass our bills overwhelmingly by putting together lobby packets that uh, featured these things and really staying on message. How do we get it done? Um, it's no one person. But I, I wanna point out that advocacy really has two main components. There's activism and there's organization. Activism is when you're doing like what I was doing in the street there with my clipboard, uh, trying to get signatures. And uh, then you have organization. And when you do those two things, you have advocacy. Activism is what you do, I think, sort of in the daylight hours when people can see you. Organization is very often what happens at uh, midnight, one in the morning when you're working on the bill figuring out amendments, following up legislators, writing letters, figuring out how to strategize with your team um, when no one sees you. And what are you doing for your, for your proposal? I wanna thank a few people in particular. Here you see um, 
in the middle picture, a fellow New York adopted person named Jennifer Sorrow. Uh, like I said, she's a fellow New York adoptee. She's a paralegal. Um, and she's got a lot of background in, in activism here in New York. She was absolutely invaluable to our efforts here in New York. One of the big things that she did, one of the highlights I can think of, uh, besides being someone who was always cheerful and has that smile on her face all the time, is to coach me and prepare, help me prepare for the work group. I was studying the public health law, studying the domestic relations law, and she really tutored me uh, to get ready for the work group so that I could help make the case uh, for unrestricted access. Down in the lower right is an out outstanding attorney named Bert Hirsch. He wrote the Indian Child Welfare Act in the 1970s, a federal bill signed by Jimmy Carter in the 70s, which made it necessary to do the best uh, that practitioners could to find people within a tribe so that a, a, a Native American uh, adopted person would most likely have the opportunity to stay uh, within their culture, within their background. And we're working to defend that law now. I'm going to mention that again in a little while. So tremendous thanks to Jennifer Sorrow and Bert Hirsch, who um, became just more than invaluable. There's no words to describe the importance. Bert Hirsch helped us not only to craft our first clean bill back together um, with uh, uh, Senator Tony Avella uh, when we got our first clean bill back here in the state, but he worked with me tirelessly for many, many hours to work on amendments, strategizing, and tutoring me um, on the great history of our, of our cause. And Bert, by the way, was there in the beginning when the Alma case in the 70s didn't go through. He sat with... Uh, he sat with Florence Fisher and they said, well, the court, the court uh, challenge to get our records didn't work. What do we do? Well, everyone has a birth certificate. So we need to introduce legislation for birth certificates. So I want you to know you're looking at one of the very early and original pioneers of coming up with the idea of us appealing for our birth certificates through legislation. To have the opportunity to work with someone like that on this cause and be tutored and taught and groomed and brought along is something very special. So I consider this kind of home base there. You see our logo in the middle there uh, for our petition, which I'll be talking about in just a few minutes. Then of course, there's the American Adoption Congress. I'm very honored again to serve there. And Shauna, there we are again in more recent times. Last October, having a good time as we're headed into the city to the good adoptee. We're getting on our way to the good adoptee. Suzanne Bachner, if you're here, welcome. Everybody involved with the play. <clears throat> and um, so, there we are strategizing, and, and Sean, I want to thank you as well, not only for your support through the AAC to help us get our policy off the ground, but all of the social media support and all the strategy assistance you provided to us. And I want to thank the rest of our board uh, members who might be here tonight, uh, Matt Naylor and uh, Tom Rector and, and everybody who could be here tonight, uh, Roberta McDonald, everybody. Uh, our board has been tremendous. I want to, you know, Amy Wynn, our former president who brought me on, Erica Babineau, my predecessor, who encouraged me to come on to the board and then encouraged you and me, right? Here we are. We didn't think we would do this, right? We didn't think we would do this, but we are, and here we are. So uh, we were very fortunate as well through the American Adoption Congress to work with a firm called Malkin and Ross in the latter part of 2018 and through most of the 2019 session uh, and there I am standing there with Carol Ann Lemon. And Carol Ann, if you're here, waving to you. Um, Malcolm and Ross assisted us with strategizing for the latter part of the, of the 2018 session and again through the 2019 session. One of the really key things, we, as many people know, we were stuck in the codes committee, codes committee, codes committee, codes committee. Malcolm and Ross scored a meeting where I was able to meet directly with the two senior counsels of the codes committee, two people that were very reticent about our proposal. Um, it was actually touch and go. We were not sure if we, this meeting was gonna come off. Uh, I had already met with assembly member Lentil and made my case to him. He said they were gonna take another look at the bill and it was time to meet with their counsels. This is a meeting that on our own, we're just not certain we could have gotten. And in the waning hours before the meeting happened, um, there, were, there were questions about whether or not the meeting would go forth. I just had every confidence that if we could just get on the phone with them, we would make our case. That's what happened. We did. And shortly after that, um, with the help of Malkin and Ross and the follow-up that we did together, we were able to get the bill sort of unstuck from codes and we were, we were on our way. It wasn't over. We had more challenges, but um, big thanks to Malkin and Ross and the lobbying support we got there. You've got to remember your roots. Where did you begin? In the spring of 1971, a woman named Florence 
Anna Fisher started the Adoptees Liberty Movement Association. She put an ad in the New York Times. She simply asked if other adoptees wanted to talk. She got an overwhelming amount of, of, of replies. And so began our movement. It is an honor and one of the high privileges of my life that Bert Hirsch introduced me to her in 2018. And there we are with a copy of her book. I want to reassure all of you that she knows about this presentation tonight. She knows about our celebration. She knows what's happening in New York. I had the privilege of telling her that the law that she envisioned has passed. And um, she was in tears and overjoyed. Um, it meant a lot to me to have that moment with her. But I want you to know this isn't about just pleasantly meeting with someone. Florence is as sharp as a tack. She's over 90 years old. And when we were doing the Mother Jones article, for example, this last year, we had to do some fact checking. I got on the phone with Florence because there was some information there from the 1970s that we needed to fact check. Florence was invaluable counseling me on that. She was able to help us get this done, uh, you know, 48 years after she started this movement. So we thank her and we honor her here tonight. And she's with us tonight in spirit. She's not on the computer, but she's with us in spirit and says hello to all of you. We also uh, had to, we, we worked with our allied advocates in the state, um, uh, such as the New York Adoptee Rights Coalition. So anybody here from NIARC, Greg, Annette, Claudia and company, welcome. And uh, we really wanna thank uh, NIARC. Uh, as many of you know, the American Adoption Congress was in NIARC. Then we were out of NIARC. We worked adjacently with NIARC. We were allies with NIARC. Uh, and uh, we made decisions uh, to do things strategically. And in the end, we felt that working adjacently as opposed to being all under the exact same roof for the last part of the last session was the best strategic decision. And we continue to work together as allied advocates and we continue to do so to this very day. So we're really excited about NIARC and particularly the immense amount of social media presence and strength and might that they showed really helped us to get the, the word out um, more and more about the bill. So we weren't just doing it from the petition at change.org and we weren't just doing it from the American Adoption Congress. And then we had witches brooms. What's a witches broom? Well, Senator uh, Parker, Senator Kevin Parker here, my senator in New York State, I met with him in, uh, several times over the years, told me, Tim, you got to go get a witch's broom, uh, which is you got to get memos of support from organizations that you think might not support you so that you can show legislators that your bill has efficacy and it's got legs and strength. So one of the things I did was I went to the Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Attorneys, people that they said they would only support us when hell froze over. And it took a couple years and it took to the work group time, but the Quad A's came on board with a national memo and then uh, supported us with a bill-specific memo for New York State. Uh, uh, North American Council on, Adop uh, on a, uh, uh, National North American Council on Adoptable Children, President Mary Boo, uh, National Center on Adoption and Permanency, Concerned United Birth Parents, uh, Adam Pertman, if you're with us tonight, glad to have you with us, and we really appreciate NCAF's support. Worked with Adam many, many times to get his um, memo. He, he gave us a memo of support, and we worked together to keep it current with the current bill numbers as we would go along. So uh, Adam, if you're here, thank you to you. Thank you to any Cub members that are here, anybody from NACAC, Quad A's. And how about Wabosni? People might be thinking, what, Wabosni? The Women's Bar Association of New York was your chief opponents, and they were. But guess what? Greg Luce from Adoptee Rights Law Center knows someone from Wabosni. He got a memo of support from a member of Wabosni. We all were able to use it in our advocacy community. It was able, we were able to show that please uh, that um, that uh, that there was that you weren't all on the same page that there were that there was people who were members of the women's bar who were on our side. So I want to just uh, I just got a quick reminder to let you know that if you've got questions coming up along the way, please make sure to put them into the Q and A. We're going to be moderating those. We're going to have them coming through uh, pretty soon. So we're getting there. Um, and then finally, the the, the petition. Uh, as I said, in 2016, I started a petition here in New York uh, to enact clean adoption reform law. That petition is now victorious with over 10,000 supporters. It took 10,000 plus people, plus the coalition, plus all of you, so many people coming together and getting announcements through our petition, through the AAC and our social media, such as the adopt uh, the alarm network. So for those of you that might have gotten announcements that way, thank you so much for participating in our calls to action. Um, this petition was really near and dear to my heart and remains so 
because even though we've declared victory on the petition, I'm still able to put updates out uh, through the petition. Uh, and um, there's a couple of links that Shauna, I think, is going to put in the Q&A of two recent essays um, that I wrote. Uh, so I want to make sure you get those. And Shauna, if you get those links, it'd be great if you put them in the Q&A if you can. If not, we'll do it at the end. But um, uh, thank you so much to anybody who supported our um, our petition. And here, I just want you to know that that picture of Assemblymember Weprin and myself is in April of 2016 when I delivered our first 1,100 signatures to Assemblymember Weprin. Uh, that was at a time when he wasn't he wasn't agreeing with us that we ought to do a clean bill right away. But I let him know there was a lot of people with their eyes on that. It was an honor to, and a privilege to represent all of those names, and not just names, but the comments that you made, the comments from people about the importance, your experiences in life. Those accompanied your signatures to the legislators many, many times, and to Governor Cuomo, the Department of Health, and everybody in the legislature that received those took those things very seriously. And it's one of the reasons we made a big difference. In fact, in my opinion, it's one of the biggest reasons we made a difference because of all of the people who came together, over 10,000 of us. So, so many people, a labor of love. So if you're gonna get something done, you've gotta have a policy, right? Um, you gotta stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Now at the American Adoption Congress before April 25th, 2018, we had a policy where we preferred unrestricted access to the original birth certificate, but in the opinion of local activists, if they thought that a compromise that would fall below that standard would work, then that would be okay for the AAC. Well, in my opinion, that contradicted our vision of no secrets and no fear at the time, because a pre preference is not a position. And it seemed like a Byzantine process. I know that in 2003, we were having trouble getting an audience with the American Adoption Congress to potentially support a clean bill here in New York when we got that first clean, that, that clean bill that I told you about earlier. Uh, but in 2017 with our new policy, which I'm gonna show you in just a second, it makes it very clear what types of bills we will support and which we won't. Um, so the AAC should not be less correct than our former opponents like the Quad A's. We should not be less progressive than the new champions of our cause, such as Assemblymember Robert Carroll. Decades of support for clean, decades of results for unrestricted access, that these types of bills have been working and by the way, uh, unrestricted access uh, or fighting for clean adoption reform is sometimes characterized as not allowing for compromise. But if you take a look at a state like Oregon, where you're going to be 21 years old and there might be a, a contact preference form, versus New York, where you're 18 years old and there's no contact preference form, uh, you can see that unrestricted access to the original birth certificate can happen in more than one way. Different states can enact unrestricted access or cleaner form in more than one way. So it's not true that compromise does not happen with clean adoption reform. It can, it just means that we have a bottom line. Uh, now that matters because when you talk to legislators, and let's take a look at the policy we have now. When you talk to legislators and you tell them, it's not that I just don't want to support a bill that won't restore equality for adult adoptees, it's that I can't. I literally don't have the latitude, Senator or Assembly Member or House Representative, because our policy at the AAC doesn't allow for that. Legislators take that very seriously when they know you have a bottom line, when they see that you've got memos of support that back you up, that you, that you are fighting for a human and civil right. Uh, so it is the formal policy of the American Adoption Congress to support state-by-state -state legislative efforts to restore unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult adoptees. This is known as clean adoption reform, which is in accordance with widely accepted best practices in adoption. As an umbrella organization, the AAC will also support efforts to gain access to all adoption agency and court records if within legislation or government actions. I'm very proud um, as of April 25, 2018, that after 40 years of the American Adoption Congress, we came to a legislative policy that has brought the AAC really into a strong position for legislative advocacy and I hope you will all agree, and I'm honored to present that policy here to you tonight as we go forward. It is my conviction that it was a very important piece to why we were able to do what we did in New York. And so it's my thanks again back to the board and back to all the members of the AAC and supporters um, for that. Um, does clean adoption reform look radical? Well, we're running out of time. So I'm going to try to come back to this news article in just a minute. Uh, but we're going to come back to a clip in just a few minutes if I can. Uh, um, from New York, um, but I'm going to try to get through these slides and then come back to a news article. 
Uh, we also, so in, in 2018, we had a nice uh, story in New York One. Maybe I'll just go to that really quick. And Kristen Shaughnessy did a news report bef uh, before our bill was passed. This is right when we were heading into having the work group. So stand by, I'm gonna um, cue that up here. Tim Monty Walpart always knew he was adopted. What he didn't know is how hard it would be to find his birth parents. Because he was adopted in New York, he has no legal right to see his original birth certificate. We don't just have a policy of sealed records, we have a culture, a culture of secrecy. After a health scare, Monty Walpart was determined to track down his biological mother in order to fully understand his medical history. It took two years, a lawyer, investigators, and money. When I found my birth mother, it afforded me the opportunity to find out more complete information about myself, heal in many ways, and, and celebrate my, my fuller identity. From there, Monty Walpart took his case to the state legislature on behalf of all adoptees. The first New York Bill of Adoptee Rights was introduced during the Cuomo administration, the Mario Cuomo administration, I believe 1994. I lobbied for the first clean New York Bill of Adoptee Rights, meaning unrestricted access to original birth certificates for adult adoptees in 2002 and three. More than 15 years later, Monty Walpart is still fighting. The Women's Bar Association is one of the last remaining opponents arguing last year the state promised parents who put children up for adoption their confidentiality would be maintained. But advocates say there is no legal right to confidentiality and that most birth mothers would waive it if they could. April Dinwoody is another former adoptee pushing Albany to act. People say, one, um, birth parents were promised anonymity. And in some cases, they, they likely were by practitioners who were not legally uh, really able to enforce anything. The hope, after decades of fighting, is that it will happen soon. Momentum is on the adoptee's side. A growing number of states have been easing access to their birth records. Assemblyman David Wepperin has reintroduced a bill that would give adoptees unrestricted access to their original birth certificates when they turn 18. We have the uh, governor on board. Uh, let's see how much, uh, you know, how far he's willing to go and uh, negotiate uh, a bill. The state health department will make a recommendation to the governor and the legislature later this month. Three reform bills already have been introduced in Albany. The legislature has until late June to act before adjourning for the summer. Kristen Shaughnessy, New York One. Okay. Okay. So that's New York One. And we were really, that, that really kicked off some tremendous coverage from New York One on April, on, on May 1st, they did a follow-up story that said that the work group had taken place. She had an amazing seven or eight minute back and forth with Roma Tori, one of the other uh, new, news anchors there. And um, <laughs> they were chiming in about how important this is. And, and Kristen even went into the uh, example that I had given her about the fact that if a person gives birth to twins, and one of them is adopted and one of them is not. And uh, the adopted person grows up and doesn't have their birth certificate and the foster care, the, the, the youth in foster care grows up and gets theirs. Uh, and the adult adopted person has say Huntington's disease uh, uh, and they need uh, to get access. Um, nope, sorry, but the foster youth that grew up and is perfectly healthy, no problem for them. Uh, so it's an either or, you get a family or you get your birth certificate. And she really presented that uh, after I had spoken to her and did it perfectly. And uh, that story really was like setting us up like volleyball uh, to get more coverage. After the bill passed and we were waiting for the law to go into effect, I was really honored to be interviewed on the Capitol Press Room, which is PBS radio here. And we were able to talk about how the law had gone into, uh, been signed and what was gonna happen next. So that helped to get the word out even more. But let's talk about media for a few minutes. And again, make sure to uh, submit some questions. I think as of now, I've got word of one question. And so I may go just a couple of minutes over uh, seven o'clock Eastern time uh, because I've got a few more slides to go. But if there's a few more questions that are coming in, I'll try to speed up, but if there's, Anything that I went too fast on or any questions anybody has, please again, submit those. We'll be really glad to get them. Um, but if not, 
totally fine. Uh, suggested media strategy. So how did we get this media strategy going in New York? For, well, for me, no one was really talking about this in the media in, in the appropriate or correct way when I came back in 2015. So my idea or the idea that I thought might work or was hoping would work was to start very, very locally. Um, small paper, small publication, a blog, a, a newsletter, anything we could get. Be friendly with the reporters, educate them. They don't know about this issue. It is our job as advocates. I think Gabrielle is probably going, wherever Gabrielle is, she might be going like this right now. And uh, Jordan Gaspor and any of the others who might be here. Um, it's our job, frankly, to tell the people in the press about our cause and help them to understand why we have the human and civil rights imperative on our side and why the people who've written about this before who've mischaracterized our cause were wrong. And now if you're a reporter out there in the United States and talking about this issue, and you're saying that birth parents were promised anonymity, you have missed the boat. You're back in the 80s, you're back in the 90s. You're not doing this right anymore. And that's because um, people like Shauna, people like Greg Luce and others that we've worked with, we've all worked together. Erica Babineau, when we worked together on the, on the Mother Jones piece this uh, last year, we worked very hard to make sure that the editors and contributors understood that we had empirical evidence to show that our, we weren't arguing just from our opinions. We were stating that these are truthful things, such as what we are talking about with confidentiality versus anonymity. These were not our views. These were our facts. And, and once the reporters and the people in the press began to understand that, we got somewhere. But we started here in, in, a new, uh, in the Ditmas Park corner, which was also known as a, a sister paper called The Brooklyner, on November 7, 2016, right when the election took place. Um, uh, got a couple thousand words in there. It's a publication that normally just talks about what's the best burrito on Greenwood Avenue. But on this particular day, they did something really important and they talked about our cause. Now, a former opponent of ours, Deborah Glick, assembly member in New York, um, said, quote, the forms may not have guaranteed privacy, but people thought they had it. They thought they were closing a chapter in their lives. And we were like, whoa, this is major. Here's one of our primary opponents saying that there was never a promise of anonymity. She's admitting it. So we took quotes like that and the empirical data that we had, and we pushed that forward to other publications to help us make our cause so that the larger publications that was harder to get through to might take us more seriously. And then of course, we were able to you know, get things like this. But what about this? Yeah, the Donaldson Adoption Institute blog, the former Donaldson Adoption Institute. Uh, on June 17, 2018, the op-ed that Gabrielle wrote in the New York Times, then the two New York One stories, New York, two stories uh, by New York One, um, the, the, uh, the, the two times I was honored to appear on Born in June, Raised in April, the podcast that April Dinwiddie has uh, on July 3, uh, 2018, and on uh, January 14, 2020, just one day before our bill, our law went into effect, we recorded that a little bit before that, to talk about the victory in New York and get the word out uh, so more people knew about their new rights. Um, so we really thank April Dinwiddie for her work and her podcast. And then in Mother Jones on March 13th, 2019, a real breakthrough piece that brought together a lot of us on the national scene advocates to talk with uh, Jordan Gaspor, an, an, a writer there then at that time, now she's working for, for PBS, I'm working with her on something for PBS now, stay tuned for that. But uh, the Mother Jones piece was amazing. It came out and we worked for, oh my gosh, I wanna say, um, I think we were contributing to Jordan and Mother Jones. I think I was working on um, contributing to that piece for nine months. Nine months, um, Mother Jones uh, was starting from zero of understanding this issue. And um, there was a lot of time that uh, Jordan took to investigate this issue herself and, and, and really, really put the thumb screws to us and really challenge us on the claims we were making. And um, if you look at that article, you'll find that I think I have one paragraph where there's a quote and I couldn't be more happy because I was joined there by Erica Babineau and Shauna. I know you were in that piece. Um, you remember what we went through to write that thing, right? <laughs> Shauna. Yes. <laughs> yes, that was months, months and months of our life dedicated to that article, but we thank Jordan for that. It was incredible.
We really, we really- It was a labor of other, love, absolutely. Other Jones gave us a chance to make our case and, um, and really, put us, really put us through our paces. But that was a real important piece because it wasn't just about New York. It was about Florida. It was about Texas. It was about uh, Minnesota. It was about everywhere. Right. Right. Then on June 3rd, 2019, I was very lucky to have an right. op-ed op in, op in Newsday. Um, and that, that piece came out right before the bill passed in the Senate. And I talked about New York adoptees deserving equality, about 500 words. And it also ran in AM New York. Um, and then um, once the bill was passed in late June of 2019, uh, the Wall Street Journal came to us and we thought, why is the Wall Street Journal coming to us? Uh, they probably want to talk about stocks and bonds. And no, they wanted to talk about adoptee rights. And so there they did an article about um, the bill had been passed and would Governor Cuomo sign it into law? Because again, the governor didn't sign it into law until November. So that article came in the interim, in the interim period when we were waiting to find out when the bill would be transmitted to the governor and if the bill, if the bill would be signed. So the bill uh, passed in June. Of 2019, and uh, in New York, there's several months where the bill could be transmitted to the governor for his final consideration. And in our case, it was trans uh, transmitted to the governor on November 14, 2019, and signed uh, the same day. So July, that article was important for us to get the word out uh, as well. And a, a little word about media, just in case people think you know we're looking for all this stuff. Um, the Newsday piece, I, I did ask for that, and we had some help getting in touch with the editor there. I'm very thankful to all the people who helped us to, to, to find out how to contact uh, people um, and make the case for hopefully getting an op-ed in there. But my philosophy about media is this. Do the least amount you can for the most amount of effect. Um, going out and looking for media opportunities doesn't need to always happen if you've got the right case. But when we look for the Brooklyner and the Dittmas Park Corner, yes, we look for that. When we do things through the petition, that's us writing it. A lot of these other things are people coming to us and asking us. So I think uh, the least amount of media for the most amount of effort is really, really good. Because if you're getting uh, too overexposed with this, sometimes you can burn yourself out as an activist. And it's very important, as others have said here tonight, um, uh, to take care of yourself. Uh, and just one thing I'd like to mention, um, going back to the statistics, I know this is kind of out of order about equality. I want to thank Shelby Jenkins and Rhonda uh, uh, Rorda, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, for their conversations yesterday about transracial adoption and equality. The statistics that we presented about the numbers of birth certificates being opened up for people from all uh, backgrounds and walks of life, very, very important. And um, I hope that uh, that, types of that type of information might help us all to continue to have these types of, of, of very important conversations for equality and to help support transracial, adopt, uh, transracial adopted persons. Um, so what if we need to counter uh, something? Um, I know, Shauna, we're coming right up on time. So are there, is there still only uh, one question at this point, or do we have many questions? There's, there's still just one question. So I would encourage okay. people to start Okay, putting so your questions in the Q&A box if they have them right now. Yeah. So if it's, if it's okay with everybody, I'm and just I, gonna... And I did put the links in there. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the links are, I'm gonna talk about those right now. Thank you so much, Shauna. So um, I'm gonna go a couple minutes over, uh, 30 minutes left. We've got just a few more slides to go. And then I'm gonna come back and we'll, we'll answer questions and go back to any slides anybody might want me to go back to. So sometimes something might come out in the press that we might not agree with, and that's okay, that happens. Uh, there was a major newspaper on August 4th, 2018, um, that said uh, that basically because of DNA testing and 23andMe and Ancestry.com and what have you, that really, as far as adoptee rights are concerned in the context of access to original birth certificates, um, not so much, not, not really so much important anymore because there's a practical way for you to find information about your background. So they said, quote, but by now it almost doesn't matter. And of course, uh, we took uh, concerns with that. We don't agree with that because there's a difference between a marketing opportunity and a product that you can buy and a civil liberty being honored by the state. Um, so, so, so we published an article, I published a, a piece on August 6, 2018 called The Civil Rights Need for Clean Adoption Reform 
does matter. Please share. <laughs> we put that out to all of our 10,000 plus supporters. We put it out through uh, AAC social media. We put it out to media contacts. And we don't hear much about the DNA, DNA issue as much anymore. And I think we touched upon this a little bit as well on July 3rd when we talked to April on born in, uh, born in June, raised in April. Um, I want to say too that when we did this article, uh, we didn't mention where the article ran. We didn't denigrate anyone. We don't talk about some article being terrible or some reporter doing a bad job. It's my view that we need to be collegial in this thing and it's our job to help people in the press and in the media and in our community to understand the merits of our cause. It's on us to know the truth. It's on us to share the truth and it's on us to be respectful and cordial as we do it. Um, we shared this piece with the author of the article um, from the large uh, publication. And um, I know that she read it. Um, and so I'm very grateful that we had a chance to uh, politely submit something to her um, without calling her out or making some big stink about having it be some litigious or uh, argument like that. We, we try to respectfully make our comments and, and our points um, without, um, without causing a, a, a consternation. I want to talk a little bit about integrated birth certificates. It's something that's come up a little bit. In New York and Maine, there have been proposals to create a third type of birth certificate. As we all know, there's the original birth certificate, and then there's the amended birth certificate. Um, and the original birth certificate is the one we're fighting for access to. The amended birth certificate is the one that's issued that has the adoptive parents and the adoptive names. An integrated birth certificate would be one where you would have the birth parents and the adoptive parents and the adoptees' original name and adoptive names. And I was speaking with someone and asking them why they would support such a proposal because such a proposal would preclude unrestricted access to the original birth certificate. And the response was that there's a concern for late discovery adoptions and, and that an, an integrated birth certificate might increase the odds that a young person who's adopted would otherwise be able to learn about their origins. And I, I very much agree with the goal of decreasing as much as humanly possible any odds that someone would become a late discovery adoptee. However, I respectfully believe, and we believe at the American Adoption Congress, that that is not a birth certificate legislative proposal because as much as we want to lower late discovery adoptees, we can never keep a secret from being kept just because we change the way a single piece of paper looks. If we change the format of a piece of paper, a birth certificate, that's not gonna stop and some adopted parents or others if they choose to keep the secret from the adopted person uh, uh, for, for, for any amount of time. So I wrote an essay on, uh, on September 30th, 2020 called Original Birth Certificates Equal Adoptee Equality integrated certificates equal discrimination. While we agree that, uh, and this is where practitioners, I hope you're listening, if there's any social workers here tonight, I hope you are. We came up with a couple of ideas to help address, and these are just thought starters, to help address uh, the importance of the disclosure of adopted status. One would be to uh, help ensure that adopted, prospective adopted parents know that it is very important for adopted people to know that they are adopted. I want to applaud Shelby Jenkins again in her commentary yesterday, in her 10 minute conversation. She touched upon this a little bit. And I agree very, very much uh, with that. Um, and adopted parents do need to be encouraged. I know my adopted parents were encouraged. There's another idea that, that, that I had and I, and I put it out there. And again, this is all for discussion in the community. What if adoptive placement agreements that adoptive, place, that adoptive parents sign would allow for visits, even home visits, by social work practitioners even after the adoption is finalized. Now I realize there could be legal, there's currently legal impediments to something like that once somebody becomes a legal parent, but if the adoptive placement agreement included it, um, this could be something that potentially could go forth. This is inspired by the idea that, for example, when students have individualized education plans in schools and they are classified as having autism, there's parent training from the social worker to the parents. Oftentimes that can happen on the telephone, 
but I believe that visits like this could happen in the home. This would serve two purposes. First, it would help ensure communication from uh, about adoption in a healthy way uh, to the adopted person and help increase the odds that they would be informed of their adopted status. And it could be done in a healthy way. And it would support, and it doesn't mean that the social worker would have to do it. It just could be support of that process and checking in with them. Uh, the other thing it could do is help prevent tragedies such as we recently heard about as the alleged abuse in Elko County, Nevada, where I believe there were seven children whose uh, number one choice of beverage that they had on their menu was to drink out of a toilet because they were tied around their necks to a doorknob and their parents left them there, allegedly, allegedly, to drink out of a toilet. The only reason anyone became aware of it is because one of the young daughters escaped and ran to the police and they came back and they uh, retrieved the children and left. But what if there were visits to help make sure that the adopted parents and the children were doing okay and communicating about adoption? Perhaps tragedies like that could be prevented. Uh, I would hope that they could. Either way, um, I submit those thoughts as ways for us to take very seriously the goal of uh, of, of, of the, the disclosure of adopted status, but not interrupt the integrity of legislative proposals to restore unrestricted access to original birth certificates, which is and must remain the imperative. So I hope you'll all read that. And Shauna, thank you for putting those links in there for people to think about. So social work practitioners, I really wanna thank you for being here. I know I sent you an invitation today. If you're there, thank you for coming. And I hope to uh, continue this conversation. Uh, it's with social work practitioners, by the way, that I spoke to who gave me some, some thumbs up on this idea. Um, so the goal is for all of our states to be green. We currently have nine states with unrestricted access to original birth certificates for all adult adopted persons. Some people might be saying, wait a minute, Tim, what about Hawaii? Why isn't Hawaii still on your list? Well, we recently learned that there's a little bit of a, a snag in Hawaii where people born in Hawaii but adopted outside the state um, are, are having a little trouble and perhaps are actually, frankly, getting blocked from getting access, the equal access to the court records, because in Hawaii, that's a court um, file access statute. Unlike in New York, where ours is a Department of Health uh, access uh, through the commissioner, uh, it's court access. So unwittingly out there, apparently, um, access to uh, uh, Hawaii, Hawaii adoptees who were adopted outside the state is uh, going through some trouble, but we're, we're back in touch with the, the great activists and adoption circle of Hawaii, we're well aware of the situation and we're hoping to color that black in, uh, back in green as soon as humanly possible. But um, you can see we've got a ways to go. Um, the goldenrod states there are states with a level of access and we are not done there. We've got to go back, we've got to fix what is not acceptable, which is that there are conditions and restrictions and limits on access, and that is not a right. That's a potential privilege based on the at the behest of another person, and it should never be up to another citizen to decide whether or not another person can have access to their own personally identifying documents. That is a precedent we should not have in this country. It's based on canards, such as that privacy was uh, uh, legally promised to birth parents, which are fa factually not true, and states like Minnesota and Montana and uh, Tennessee and others and Illinois and uh, Indiana uh, and Pennsylvania, uh, frankly, have got to get their act together. We've got to go back and we've got to get it right. The states in red are states where you cannot have access without a court order. Uh, but now that we've got New York, a state that they said would never happen, uh, you could never get it done because New York was kind of considered ground zero of secrecy, we're really hoping, especially in those large diverse states, that we're gonna have traction. I wanna thank Greg Luce from Adoptee Rights Law Center, who does such a great job with these graphics and all the work that he does at his great website there. Um, so what's next for us now? Well, in New York, um, we're gonna keep working with the State Department of Health. I've got a meeting coming up with them very soon to double back with them. As some of you may have seen, we got statistics from the State Department of Health. As of July 31st, I think there was somewhere upwards of 9,700 or so applications for birth certificates. And uh, in the city recently, there was a story that showed within the five boroughs, there was some 5,400. So we've reached back out to the city department of health to give us updated statistics. And we're meeting with the state department of health again soon. And they just have been tremendous in working with us and uh, helping us to get this uh, law rolling. So for those of you that may be encountering delays 
because of the pandemic, I want you to know we've communicated um, back to the uh, both departments health, very concerned about this, and they're working to get caught up. In fact, the city just increased their staffing by a few so that they could get more um, applications out more quickly. So please go to our petition at change.org. You'll see our latest updates there. Um, I think my update on uh, in late September gave more uh, information about how to apply and um, uh, um, um, get caught up with the latest, but there'll be more information coming out again soon. We're gonna keep helping applicants in the state with specific issues that come up, continue to work with our allies, such as the groups like the New York Adoptee Rights Coalition, and please stay tuned because there could be more happening for New York and we'll keep you posted. And beyond, um, Shauna, I know you are leading and working with the great Texas Adoptee Rights Coalition. We're looking forward to a, a productive session in Texas, despite the fact that there's a pandemic, there is a session that's gonna be coming up in Texas and we know you're working hard on um, getting ready for that. We are right behind you. And um, we're working at the AAC with the Capital Coalition of Adoptee Rights which includes Washington, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. We were excited to see some traction in Maryland last session. We're gonna be coming back and working on that. We're having some preliminary discussions about California. I wish I could go into details, but I know there are people here tonight who are hopefully smiling right now. I'm winking at you because we're gonna have some hopefully exciting developments about what might be possible for California. Uh, we believe we can do it. We believe we can get it done. If we can do it in New York, we can do it in California. So I hope that you'll stay tuned in the next few months for some hopeful announcements about how we might be moving forward with advocacy there. We've got an advocate, for example, in West Virginia, ready to move with a clean bill. And uh, in, in italics there, we'll go a little bit beyond the legislation. We're talking about adoption practice as, as in uh, integrated birth certificates. We're working to defend the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was written by Bert Hirsch and also continuing to work with allies such as Adoptees United. We're gonna be having a town hall next Tuesday, right, Shauna? It's Tuesday. We're gonna have a town hall and we're gonna be meeting to continue conversations like this. So what is the future of adoptee rights? It's really not a matter of if, it's only a matter of adoptee equality when adoptee equality is restored everywhere, every square inch of the United States and the world because it is absolutely a human right to know where you come from and it's a civil right um, to have unrestricted access to your personally identifying information, your original uh, birth certificate. So uh, I wanna wrap this up by just saying thank you to all of you. It took thousands and thousands of people to come together to achieve this human and civil rights imperative um, for the state of New York. We know we can get it done for everywhere. Um, and it's a privilege and an honor um, to uh, be here with you tonight. Um, just one year um, after um, Governor Cuomo signed our law um, into, um, in signed our bill into law. It, it meant a lot to me personally uh, to receive my birth certificate. And I know that there are thousands and thousands of people who are the real winners in all of this uh, because they thought maybe they would never uh, get a chance to know. It doesn't mean they're gonna have a reunion. Maybe they just want it for their file, but this is their birth certificate. It belongs to them. So there's my email address. Uh, tmw 713 at gmail so um again it's an honor and, and thank you so much so shauna i uh i'm here and uh are you ready for questions yeah i sure am so let's uh why don't we start with the first one you received if you want to go in order Sure. So the first question is from our friend Gabrielle Glazer. And she asks, what was the response of the people you spoke to about your rights? They signed, but what? I'm oh, sorry, can you repeat that? Gabrielle Glazer asks, what was the response of the people you spoke to about your rights? They signed, but what did you say? the response of the people we spoke to about our rights. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I understand the question. They signed onto the bill, but what did they say? <laughs> oh, the, oh, you mean the legislators? The legislators themselves or? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, you know, we lobbied many legislators on this issue over the, over the years. And um, very often they started off wondering if we were going back uh, sort of on a promise. Um, and 
we presented the facts just as we did here tonight. And many of them were really stunned. They said that they just didn't, um, didn't know uh, that this was um, the case. They didn't know that, um, that there was no uh, legal promise to lifelong uh, anonymity. So then they would ask other questions uh, about it. They would ask, they would say, well, they had a friend that was adopted. And they might say things like, well, Tim, I have a friend that's adopted and they don't want their birth certificate. What do you think of that? And I would say, well, that's more power to them. <laughs> you know, if, if, we're not asking the state to mail these out like it's the publisher's clearinghouse. We're asking the state to make them available for access. If someone chooses to avail themselves of a right, just like voting rights, if you choose to avail yourself of your right to vote, um, then you, you vote. If you choose um, not to, um, then you don't. Um, we want to give every adult adopted person the option to exercise um, this right. Um, it, it is a right. And because it is a right, uh, they realize then that it wasn't about whether or not their friend wanted their birth certificate at that time. And by the way, um, I also pointed out to them that you meet a lot of adopted persons. I, myself, present company included, that when I was much younger, people would ask me if I ever wanted to go search or find or get information. And the answer was, uh, no, I'm not going to be doing that. That wasn't my initial intent. Um, and so um, I, didn't, I didn't plan on doing that. Um, and, but things changed. Uh, I had a medical scare in the 90s. It changed everything. I began to look, I wanted my medical history and I learned that I couldn't just, the non-identifying information wasn't sufficient. And I, and I went from there and it, and it kind of blossomed. So, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, next question, are you ready? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Rich Yearlab asks, uh, congratulations on the victory in New York. Given that every court that has ruled on the issue, including Greg Luce's recent petition for his own records before the DC Court of Appeals, has affirmed that access to OBCs is a state-by-state -state issue and not an absolute fundamental civil rights issue, isn't it disingenuous to continue to approach this issue as a civil right? A uh, short answer, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think that uh, we want to be careful here. It's an excellent question. I think um, in terms of uh, the DC courts, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm not totally familiar with the specifics of how that played out. But here's what I will say. Um, just, it, it looks like, it sounds as if there was a comment about uh, that it's a state by state issue. Uh, and I think that's where we really want to key on here. Um, yes, it is. And, and we have to take a look at why is it a state by state issue? And, and my understanding of why it's a state by state issue, and again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm gonna sp speak to this as best I can, and others may be able to speak to this even more clearly, is because the laws that govern adoption are made state by state. And so therefore any determination by a court that would be a federal court or a court of jurisdiction beyond a state that would make an indication that would suggest or insinuate something different is, as is inherent in the question, a reference not to the, the efficacy of the civil right, not to whether or not there's a civil right, but to the indication that the battle for the restoration of that right is occurring at a particular level, in this case, at the state level. We would love nothing more <laughs> than to have uh, the idea of a federal bill that would do this in one fell swoop. In fact, uh, Rich, I think you'll know, I think we'll probably agree. You take a look at uh, England, you take a look at uh, other places, uh, those were national actions to restore uh, a measure of access, whether it was complete access or not. We see that in other countries, it's not always done uh, this way in a state by state or a province by province way, although we see in Canada, for example, that it is. So I would uh, indicate that a, a, a determination like that is a reference to the fact, as you rightly point out, uh, that it is a state uh, by state issue. 
one that is governed uh, by laws that are made and promulgated at the, the state level, as we pointed out about New York in 1936, 1938, the 1960s. And certainly, uh, you take a look, uh, for example, one of the great historians of this movement, uh, Christopher Filippo, we call him Toff. He's here in New York. He's a member of Bastard Nation. He's amazing. He's one of the most amazing. His brain is, I believe, a supercomputer. I'm looking into this. I'll get back to everybody. Please, he's a computer. He's just amazing. And he's gone back and, and looked and has actually published books that have given us a, a snapshot, for example, in New York, of all of the historical legislation, state-level legislation uh, that governed uh, adoption laws in the states. And of course, we know this is the case in all the states. That's why we're talking about the fact that there's um, the Kansas and Alaska, for example, making the decision not to block access for adult adopted persons ever, even though they did and still continue to, as we do in all 50 states, seal the original birth certificate upon the completion of the adoption. Um, those are state that, that I can't think of any better way to illustrate the fact, as you as you rightly point out, the state by state legislative push to get this done. It's arduous. It's tough. It's a house by house, block by block deal. And as, as far as I can tell, that's all the court was saying there. Uh, so, um, so I would respectfully submit that uh, we're right on track for this thing. Um, and I would also sit, indicate that if anyone goes back and looks at the video of the legislators in June of 2019, when our bill was made into law, assembly member after assembly member standing up and affirming this civil right and even going so far as to apologize. I never, we never flattered ourselves that we would get an apology from our legislators in our state. But that's precisely what they did. They stood up on the floor of the New York Assembly and apologized. Um, and it was a very emotional, very moving moment. So it is a human right to know where you come from. And it is a basic civil right to have unrestricted access to your original birth certificate. Thank you for the question though. I love the question. <laughs> Thank you for that, Rich. So there we are. Um, we got about eight minutes left. So I'm wondering if there's anything, uh, anything else. I hope there's, I hope there's any other questions. We'd we love do. To okay. We do. Can you hear me, Tim? I can. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we have a question from Kara Greenberg. Kara Greenberg. Um, Kara. Yes. Kara asks. Kara asks, what was the biggest challenge you faced while doing this, and how did you continue through such challenges? Ooh. What was the light at the end of the tunnel? Great well, question. Sounds like a good two-part question. I would say the, the biggest yeah. challenge in all of this um, was to remember to take care of myself. Um, it's very easy to stay up till one, okay. three in the morning. I've got work the next day. Um, getting sleep, making sure to eat, um, going for my run. I love to run. I'm a runner. I've been running since I was 13 years old. Um, staying hydrated, the basics, you know, and, and, and keeping a semblance of my own life and remembering um, that we can do it. I'll tell you something I used to do um, in the really tough moments, Kara, and I really appreciate that question. I was very lucky when I found my birth mother in 1998. She had a copy of what's known as a birth mother's copy of a birth certificate that my grandmother somehow got, and it had my name on it, my original name, but it didn't have a mother. Um, it was as if I came out and descended from the heavens and didn't have any parents. But I, I, my mother actually had that, and I had a copy of that. And um, I'll just impart to you. I, I don't really tell people this often, but personally, when it got, when things got really tough, it would be one in the morning, two in the morning, and you just wonder if you're going to get through it. I would take it out, and I would look at, at um, or I would talk to my mother and and tell her that I love her, and she would tell me that she loves me, and I would tell her that. I'm just glad that uh, we were able to, to get this done for ourselves. And she would tell me that uh, um, I have to remember to keep it in perspective and just do the best I can for all of us to do the best we can. And to remember, there's a lot, a lot of people behind us, a lot, a lot of people supporting us. It's not all on me. It's, it's so many people coming together. And as far as when did I see the light at the end of the tunnel? The minute I knew he signed it. <laughs> Uh, the minute I knew on November 14th, 2019, that Governor Cuomo had signed the bill into law, 
that's when I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I took nothing for granted, nothing, nothing, nothing. In fact, I did very little celebrating. I remember 10 minutes after the bill was signed, I was on the phone with the Chronicle for Social Change and Michael Fitzgerald because he was, he needed a quote. <laughs> and so there was no time. And then we were off to a party. It was uh, assembly member Robert Carroll's birthday party that night. <laughs> so we had no time to stop and, and really think. And for the, the light at the end of the tunnel, there was, it was like running. You run through the tape. You run through the finish line. You keep working. And now I'm looking at Shauna's face and getting. And we we just that's how you have to do it because Texas, Florida, California, uh, everywhere we've got to get it done. Great question, Kara. Thank you for that. Yeah. So that so Rich asked this language from the favorable ruling upholding Measure 58 in Oregon refers to access as a legitimate interest which does not equate to a fundamental right. This affects our strategy and talking point. That's not really a question, but then um, he goes on to say the Ohio AG describes it as a procedural right, which actually works to our advantage. Okay. I think these are just additional comments. Yeah, thank you, Rich. I think, uh, uh, you know, um, the, I, we know there was that challenge in, in, in Oregon back then and the, and the state Supreme Court upheld it. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor refused uh, to, to stay the law and the result of all of this was what we have in Oregon, which was um, an unrestricted uh, access uh, law that was not successfully challenged by, um, by those who, who, who challenged it. Um, as far as the AG comment is concerned, um, uh, it sounds like you're saying that that's a helpful one in terms of making the case. I, I suppose I'd have to see it in more detail um, to know more of the specifics. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then we have one more, uh, Sarah okay. Schott. She asks, what Sarah. about born? She asks, what about born in one state, but adopted in another? Born Washington, DC, adopted in Maryland. Okay, so in Maryland, uh, there was some traction for a bill last session. Um, it didn't pass. We're hoping uh, through the Capital Coalition of Adoptee Rights, um, that that uh, effort will, it's going to definitely continue. I know with the pandemic, we don't know how bills will, will go now, but we're going to stay on this. Um, but I, what I will say is we're very proud in New York to have it, I think I mentioned, did I mention earlier that if you were born in another state, uh, but adopted in New York, you have access to the identifying information that would have appeared on uh, the original birth certificate. Um, in Maryland, um, thank you for that comment. I, I get the, imp the impression that you would like to see something like that, perhaps in the Maryland bill. And I assure you, I will relay that back to CCAR um, and let them know. And the activists that are on the ground um, uh, will take that into consideration if that's what you're hoping for. I'll definitely pass that along. Thank you. We're hoping that that fact that we got that done in New York is something that can catch fire elsewhere too. Thank you for that. I think that's it for questions. Oh my gosh. So here we are. So it's 728 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And again, with the last minute here that we have, I would just want to say again, Shauna, to you, what an honor and a privilege it is to serve with you. Uh, first, to know you as a person on this earth. I'm very thankful every day to know you and um, extremely grateful for all that you do. Um, you are one of the um, most amazing. Uh, activists I've ever met in any context and to have you here to support this presentation is great. It's always great to be with you. We presented together in DC and so we kind of did tonight again. It's the Tim and Shauna show and uh, we'll do it again and I want to thank everyone in this room for your questions, for being here. I hope you enjoyed it uh, as we celebrate New York and onward, onward, onward human and civil rights. Thank you. To all of you, I hope the conference winds up well. Thank you to Celia Center. Thank you to everybody. And that's it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.